All right, we are live. We are live on Facebook. We are finally live on Facebook. Good evening, everybody. Arach Media Live. I'm here, David Ojakian, co-founder uh, with co-founder Greg Nemet. Uh, Richard Vartan Kazanja and our producer will be joining us uh, momentarily. We apologize, guys. We have a very special guest as well. I'm not apologizing for the guest. I'm apologizing for the uh, very challenging technical difficulties we've had tonight, Greg. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. I guess, William, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, just your patience tonight and everybody for messaging us and commenting on the page. Uh, we are live. We got it figured out. Um, and we hope that Richard will be able to join us soon uh, during the show. But we are joined by a very special guest. Greg, thank you for bringing this guest to us. And um, thank you to all of our, our viewers and supporters for your uh, support of, of our guest as well. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. William Bayramian, he is founder and editor of the Armanite, um, the online publication, the Armanite. He's also former director of the ANCA Western Region, uh, as well as communications director at the American University of Armenia. Uh, William, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so, so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, welcome to Arach Media. Thank you, David. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Rich, uh, if you're listening in. I'm uh, very happy to be here with Audash Media. Love you guys' work. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, thank you. It was a, it was a to everybody out there. Um, apologize for the for the late start, but we we uh, we had the you know the blunders of all blunders. But here we are. There's a lot to talk about. William, thanks for joining us. There is uh, a, a lot of information that we want to kind of discuss with you, a lot of questions we want to ask you. Uh, we just want to make this lively. Uh, those of you that are watching online, you can chime in via you know, Facebook like live comments and we'll try to pick up some of the questions and we'll uh, you know, pipe it over to William and we'll try to kind of make this interactive as possible. We got a bunch of questions. Um, you know, typically we try to keep it tight, but today we're just gonna make sure to cover every, you know, as much as we can. Um, David, let's let's jump into. Uh, we have like a whole series yeah. of things to ask you, but we want to make sure that uh, what do you call it? We we do it in a structured manner. A so, absolutely. Uh, you know, William, we'll just get started right away. Again, thanks for joining us. Just let us know what what can you tell us? Uh, just tell us a little bit about your background. What can you share with us about your time? Uh, well, excuse me. Sorry. Just tell us share with us about your background and how you got into communications and politics and and really what you're up to today. If you could share that with us. Sure. sure. Yeah. So I, I actually come from a political background. I, uh, I studied political science in undergrad at UCLA. And then again at uh, Columbia, where I studied security policy, um, focusing mostly on defense and intelligence issues. Um, that's where my research interests were. And that's where I did most of my research in grad school. Uh, when I graduated, I you know, sort of went right back into politics, which is, which is where I had worked previously. And I uh, took on the position of the executive uh, director at the ANCA Western Region, as you mentioned, David, uh, where I worked for a little bit over two years, you know, was, uh, as I think uh, probably all you guys are familiar, uh, it's a lot of work, uh, both on the ground and also on a state and, and occasionally on a national level. You know, I'd done work in uh, Washington, D.C. with the ANCA, and, uh, you know, it was just partly a continuation of that, of course, but also... Uh, a lot of grassroots uh, work in the community, um, working with our local activists and organizers, uh, not just in California, but also throughout the Western United States. So in places like Idaho, uh, Arizona, Texas, uh, all over the place. So, you know, I, I did that for a little over two years. And uh, once I was done with that, I, you know, during that time had decided that I wanted to continue working in the Armenian world and had made the decision to found a, a publication. And that is what became the Armenite, uh, which I launched in 2014. So uh, we just uh, marked our seven year anniversary in February and it's been around for seven years and it hasn't always been as active as I, as I would have liked. But the fact is that, you know, uh, I've, I've essentially been running it uh, more or less by myself uh, with a lot of help uh, from friends and, and, and some really good people, but, uh, you know, mostly on a volunteer basis. So, you know, I've been doing that, of course, uh, throughout the years. Uh, I also, uh, shortly after launching the Armenite, uh, moved to Armenia 
where I worked in a number of different capacities. I worked with uh, Repat Armenia. I worked with the uh, Aurora Prize uh, and the Tathevej, a lot of the IDEA found Foundation projects. Um, I was actually part of the original team uh, with the Aurora Prize when it was first getting started and uh, eventually became the communications director at AUA. It's not exactly my uh, field, uh, but you know, given my experience in, in journalism uh, and also my experience in political communications, it, was, it just happened to be a good fit. So I, I, you know, I served as the director of communications at the American University over there for uh, almost two years, not quite, but uh, you know, yeah. then uh, left and, and, and have been pretty much focused on, on the Arminite and some other uh, projects that I've had on the side. Amazing, amazing. So, I mean, mostly uh, writing. That's, that's, quite, yeah. that's, that's quite a resume. Uh, I will also kind of full disclosure, I myself, uh, for the past few, I don't know, a week or so, I've been kind of uh, going through the Arminite. And boy, yeah, there's a lot of content, a lot of uh, important research. We'll concentrate on a couple of things that predominantly something that you recently released that kind of not a bombshell of an uh, of uh, of info but definitely ties in a lot of questions that we may have so my question is this um uh, one of the one of the articles that you dive into essentially is in the foreign money and as it is uh influencing the armenian media how did you kind of befall onto that path and then how did that uh article essentially kind of blossom into fruition and maybe a little detail about what 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 exactly you uncovered yeah it's a lot of it, you know, as, as with a lot of these sort of really long pieces, uh, it started off as something completely different. Uh, it had, I mean, I had no intention of uh, elucidating, you know, the, 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 the question or the case of foreign money in, in Armenia. Uh, it's not even something that would have crossed my mind, but this has been years in the making, right? This is, this is just me being involved in the Armenian community and then, you know, uh, following Armenian politics for, you know, uh, over a decade at this point, very closely. And, uh, you know, just as with any uh, journalistic endeavor, well, I was asking a lot of questions. And uh, when I was asking questions and not, unable to find answers, uh, I decided to, to seek out the answers myself. And that's I would say the genesis of, of this article that I wrote, uh, the foreign money in Armenia piece. And, uh, you know, the reason that, it, uh, that I sort of settled upon that eventually was because, you know, over time, I just realized, you know, we have all these, you know, discussions, everybody has them, all Armenians have them, uh, whether you're in the diaspora or you're in Armenia. And, you know, you have them around coffee tables, but you also have them during conferences. And, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It was very interesting to me because a lot of the conversations focused on, you know, very particular uh, uh, themes. Right. And one of those themes was was always corruption. Uh, another one of those uh, themes was, you know, uh, the, the political um, um, sort of I should say the, the, the governmental system. Right. That uh, Armenia had where, you know, people would always uh, say that. Armenia is a dictatorship or, you know, uh, authoritarian or semi-authoritarian. And, you know, coming from a political background, I just couldn't understand, you know, how or why one might be describing Armenia as these things when, uh, you know, based on the facts, that just was not the case, right? It when was imperfect. Ali, Ali, Ali next door is a juxtaposition, for, for example, right? When we have that as a comparison <laughs> to the Armenian state. I mean, especially, right, especially Aliyev, but, you know, you also have uh, a, a number of countries in the Middle East, right? Uh, you have all the Central Asian countries, which are also post-Soviet states. Uh, these are all uh, uh, dyed-in-wool uh, dictatorships. And what you're essentially doing by calling Armenia a dictatorship or an authoritarian regime is you're putting them in the same basket, right? And that's, you know, I, I started to, to, to think that, well, well this, is, this is dishonest. So I, I wanted to know where it came from. Um, and just just to be sure, you know, I, like pretty much everybody else, just assumed that this was true for, for a good period of time. You know, yes, Armenia is corrupt. Yes, Armenia is a dictatorship. Yes, you know, people are leaving because of the corruption and dictatorship. Uh, therefore, these things need to be addressed. And if these things are not addressed, uh, Armenia will, will forever suffer and, and fail as a state. At some point, I started realizing, 
you know, there's there's something going on here, right? When everybody is saying the same thing, it sounds less like original thinking, and it sounds a little bit more like, uh, you know, they were, uh, you know, somehow uh, cultivated, right? And 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 told in some way, shape, or form to say those things. Mm -hmm. And and from what I understand from your research, right? There are there are you you underline a couple of entities, types of entities that start doing that, right? Some go as small as you know, tiny NGOs funded always from the from foreign interests, so essentially you know, uh, foundations from abroad. Then there's straight up government entities, right? That are there that are also infiltrating Armenian uh, 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 media market. Um, what can you talk about the, uh, the the ecosphere of what you found, right? What is the mechanisms uh, with the buildup throughout years that essentially just kind of brings us to today where we are? Mm -hmm. So you have essentially three different types of funding entities, right? One is the international organization. So something like the United Nations, for example, right? The United Nations, which has its own um, uh, objectives. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to what sort of ties all of them together, but uh, one of them is, is the international organization. Uh, uh, the other one is, is just, you know, national governments. So you have uh, for example, you know, the United States, which is heavily involved in this, and, you know, primarily uh, Western governments, uh, if not exclusively, at least, you know, all the ones that I mentioned were, were Western governments. So you have the United States, you have the United Kingdom, you have the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, uh, Germany, uh, who are very heavily involved in this. And then you have private foundations, and the private foundations are the ones like the Open Society Foundations, the Ford Foundation, for example, which does less uh, work, at least in Armenia, but uh, is, is, you know, very involved uh, in this sort of political work. And, you know, many others that you might not have even ever heard of, like there was one uh, which actually provides a lot of funding in Armenia called the Sigrid Roust Foundation, which I found out about, you know, through, you know, a long period of research uh, and had never heard of, but provides hundreds of thousands of dollars of funding to specific organizations in Armenia. And generally what they're doing is they're, they're promoting uh, this uh, liberal democratic uh, paradigm, uh, which they consider to be the correct way of organizing a society where you have, you know, uh, liberal democratic uh, views uh, uh, premised upon, you know, an open society, you know, that's, it's not random that that foundation is called that. Um, and the the principles therein are are constructed by that by that political philosophy and it's you know uh, very much in many cases opposed to the idea of open border i'm sorry um, actual borders uh, it's generally opposed to the idea of militaries um, uh, very often uh, opposed to the uh, um, uh, societies uh, that are traditional or uh, in any way conservative. And, uh, you know, this pretty much described uh, not only Armenia, but, but many other countries where these, where these organizations have been very heavily involved in political work, right? And that's one caveat that I'd like to add before, I, before we continue, because I think it's important. I think there is some misunderstanding there that, uh, you know, foreign money is, is all bad right? Foreign money, money doesn't need to be bad, right? But uh, when foreign money is given to uh, essentially undermine the political system or to undermine, you know, the traditions of a society or to uh, effectively finance an opposition in the country, uh, making it rather undemocratic, right? Because it, it's very difficult to actually oppose that with local resources, it makes it very difficult. Um, uh, it, it, it makes it uh, really twisted. Uh, whereas if you're, for example, financing roads, you know, bricks and mortar stuff, right? Like, yeah. uh, for example, AUA also got money from the United States government through US aid, but it never got it for that, you know, like anti-corruption programs. So far as I know, uh, what it did get money for uh, was to build university buildings, right, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, house students or, um, you know, created labs for them to, to, you know, learn a variety of things that they would otherwise not be able to do. 
And, you know, these aren't the only examples. There are roads that could be built. I mean, for, you know, technically, if we look at it, a lot of the money that Armenia Fund, for example, and I also uh, worked with Armenia Fund for, for a while um, you know, on their projects and, and, and uh, writing about their projects. Armenia Fund, you know, a good chunk of the money is coming from abroad, you know, from which, you know, uh, and, and is yeah. foreign in nature. But, you know, built hospitals, built roads, built community centers, built schools. Nothing wrong with that. Right. So, uh, so what I'm understanding, right, is that, yeah, obviously foreign investment, foreign aid into infrastructure projects, that's good. But what we're noticing, especially through your research, there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on media control and media manipulation. Is that, am I getting this correct? Yes, yes, there's a, there's a lot. Uh, it, there's a disproportionate amount of money that is uh, given to uh, media organizations and what are called civil society organizations, what you know are alternatively called uh, nonprofits, under the guise of civil society uh, development. Right, that's the that's the sort of the catchphrase. Um, that also actually includes a lot of the media work. It's always civil society. Civil, so when you hear civil society, you can assume that it's you know one of these projects. And, uh, and one of the things, right, so I, I'll be honest with you, I'll raise my hand. I was one of the guys, I'm a progressive guy. That's the, the way that I think is, uh, you know, like uh, is out of the box often. And, you know, Soros for the longest time was kind of like the boogeyman. But then I started to notice what I read on, you know, I was like, you know what, let's dive in. Let's see what's going on here. Um, you notice that some of these, uh, uh, in, uh, what do you call it, fundings are clearly written on the, on the mm -hmm. open societies, what do you call it, on the foundations page, right? When I started to notice that, and that was actually your finding as well, right? Where some of these things are hidden, but a lot of them are actually not. And there's like line item, straight, straight piping funding to Armenian NGOs, media conglomerates, et cetera, et cetera. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's actually funny. I, I even wrote about it in the article, right? Like the the, the George Soros conspiracy canard, which mm -hmm. is uh, which was meant to actually address the idea. And this has actually been the the, the only um, uh, criticism that I've actually seen of the article, which is except you know with name calling and stuff. Which is oh you know his is you know Soros you know this is another Soros conspiracy. The point you know that I made in the article. Uh, and I wanted to address that beforehand was that this is this isn't a conspiracy, right? This is something that you know Soros. I mean, this, first of all, open society foundations very openly, much to their credit, uh, says that this is an organization that was founded by George Soros with these specific goals in mind, mm -hmm. right? There is no secret about that, and they're also very forthcoming about what they provide the money for, right? And so we know that they're pouring, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into certain organizations in Armenia. And they have been for well over a decade. Now, this isn't a secret. This isn't any, you know, this, this, you know I don't have some sort of anti, uh, uh, you know, it's not anti uh, uh, George Soros himself as an individual. I mean, you know, he made a lot of money and he's spending it in, uh, uh, I mean, generally he should be able to, do whatever he wants with it, but I do have a problem with it when he's spending his money to overturn, uh, you know, a society, a country, and to influence unduly, in my opinion, okay, the the political atmosphere and environment in a country where where he, frankly, I'm sorry, he doesn't live, he doesn't understand the circumstances, he doesn't know what is necessary there. So how is it that, you know, somebody who just made a ton of money? is able to you know, have such an outsized influence in uh, a place like Armenia or anywhere for, for that matter. And a lot of countries have, have recognized that and I'm sure we'll talk about that um, where I think we should talk about that if, if we have time. Absolutely. Yeah, William, um, real, real quick follow up to that. Like, I find it hard to believe that it's actually Soros himself doing it, right? Who, who's doing this? Who is actually using his money and implementing the money to try to have this impact? on the media who who are the cronies if you will like well what? uh yeah. the soros uh you know the soros foundation it was actually called the soros foundation previously before being renamed as the open society foundations but uh, uh it's actually run by his son now in in effect because soros is so old uh but look the principles are set out by uh soros or were set out by soros himself they're being continued now by a, i mean they have a very 
large staff in their headquarters, and then they have uh, you know, significant staffs in all the places in which they operate. And they, uh, you know, it's, it, it's according to this, uh, it's partially, I should say, based on this philosophy uh, developed by uh, a German philosopher uh, named Karl Popper, um, where uh, when he wrote a book called or titled Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, it's, a, it's pretty a long work. I think it's two volumes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, and he, 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 he sets out a very you know, complex philosophy, political philosophy about, about the, the need for an open society. And uh, George Soros was, was enamored of this idea when he read it. I mean, George Soros was also at the London School of Economics, uh, which is where Karl, Karl Popper taught. Uh, so he adopted this as essentially his life philosophy, right? And when he made money, uh, he wanted to implement this idea using the money uh, that he made. And uh, he's succeeded in some, in, in, some, in some very major ways, right? At least in convincing lots of people that this is the right way of doing things. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah, well. um, so you, you mentioned obviously Soros, everything. I, I, I kind of familiarize myself with his background a lot to do with the UK. In your article, I just picked up on something that was on, the, you know, on my radar a little bit. You said there's a lot of uh, government entities, NGOs, and then you a little bit highlight the UK government has a thing for Armenia, right? Can you elaborate on that? Because I mean, I, I have an idea, I have an understanding. There's a lot of uh, infrastructure, we can say projects in the area that the UK government probably wants never to be touched, right? Um, if you can allude to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, the UK obviously has a lot of interests in uh, the Caspian oil fields, uh, always has uh, had those interests uh, from the time that the Baku oil fields were developed by Carlos Gulbenkian and, and others. Uh, and, you know, BP is very heavily involved in the, in, in the oil industry in uh, BP, British, British Petroleum, is very heavily involved in the, in the oil industry oil and gas industry in Azerbaijan. Uh, we know that a UK company took over some mining interest that was in uh, Artsakh after the war when uh, Azerbaijan occupied those lands after it was uh, gifted to them uh, by the current Armenian government. So uh, the UK is obviously uh, very heavily involved in Azerbaijan uh, yeah, business-wise. It has lots of interests. I don't make that connection in the sense that I can't, uh, that would just be, that would be conjecture on my part, yeah. right? That the United, uh, the, the, the uh, government of the United Kingdom was promoting certain things in Armenia for that reason. But I will qualify that by saying that uh, judging by the history of the United Kingdom, how it's operated in other places, how the British Empire used to operate, and I, I did make allusions to the to the to the British Empire and the Raj in India, and how they operated uh, with sort of uh, the the locals. They very frequently tie national interests to economic interests and business interests, right? So uh, even the British Empire, uh, at least in uh, India and some other places was very closely tied with the, uh, the English uh, traders who established themselves in, in, in uh, South Asia and then who eventually needed to be protected by the British crown. So that's what, you know, uh, sort of opened the door to the British coming in. Uh, I don't discount uh, the possibility that that is, is similar to what the UK was doing in uh, Armenia. I would like to also add that the, uh, the representative of one of the UN organizations in Armenia during the war, uh, who was a British woman, uh, was accused uh, was accused of uh, spying, of espionage, and very quickly left the country and nothing ever uh, was, was clear about that. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was, there, was, there was accusations that she was spying for Azerbaijan um, and also for the UK government, even though she was an international organization worker, she was working for the UN, not for not for the gov government. Mm -hmm. um, whatever came of that, I don't know, right. but uh, we we know that the UK has been uh, for you know for whatever reason, it's, it's one of the one of the main funders of, of many of these organizations. 
So um, yeah, we'll talk in facts. We'll talk. There's there's a little bit of uh, illusion there of what you know. Definitely, the UK has some some interest uh, uh, in Armenia. We won't talk about on which end, but also in your article you mentioned right. So now we have all this funding, all this money coming into Armenia. Uh, there's a quote I mentioned. So now Armenia is essentially converted into a full fledged vassal like the British Raj. Can you uh, unpack that? What what do you mean by that? Is that essentially kind of is the metamorphosis slowly being completed? with you know this administration with what's happening right now or where are we in this in this process yeah i mean so as i was saying in india what what happened was essentially uh, you had money essentially right british money that that uh entered uh, south asia and over time what started happening was that the the british started cultivating locals uh, to uh, uh, become a part of their project in uh, South Asia and in other places, right? Not just in not just in South Asia, uh, but that's the, the one example that everybody I think is familiar with. And uh, essentially, over time, using the resources that they had, and the one big difference being that a lot of the resources in, in South Asia, I mean, South Asia itself, and I, I say South Asia because it wasn't just India, right? It was India, uh, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, uh, uh, and, and others, um, which later split after the British left. But uh, when I say South Asia, I mean, all, all, you know, all three of those. The, the British uh, eventually recruited locals to uh, administer a lot of what was going on uh, in South Asia or, you know, British India, let's just call it that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, they, they had governors and they had, they had, they had military people, uh, they had administrators. And yes, eventually what happened was that they, they did have, of course, um, Englishmen, and I shouldn't say Englishmen, uh, Brits, actual uh, British people, because there was a lot of uh, Scotsmen among them. Uh, as well, who uh, administered the whole thing, but okay, it was with the the complicity of locals. And in Armenia, you essentially have a very similar situation where, uh, you know, for a long time, foreign money was coming in, and they were creating and recruiting this 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 vast network of people who were dependent on foreign money for their livelihoods. And eventually, what happened was they were able to usurp power right by deposing the elected government of the country and replacing that government with their representatives i mean uh, the pashinyan government uh, from from the very top okay is is composed of uh, people who have lived on the foreign dime for for a very long time mm -hmm. so yeah. that's 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 why i drew that comparison I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that's how I that's how I read it, and that's 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 how I see it. Um, so another thing that I, we're noticing, obviously, we're going to talk about the election, what, what what's going, on, what happened there, and how we're going to move forward. But there seems to be, and I'm not going to point fingers to anyone, right? But there seems to be like this um, a community of people, let's call it that, um, that have went there now, um, living there, and essentially they're pandering this this now new push, essentially, right? It's it's let's move past this. Let's move on. Let's keep building Armenia. Um, aside from there being a lot of issues with what what is being what is being stated out of from those individuals, um, what do you think drives that statement? Uh, and once in a while, it comes to my mind: Oh my God, can we actually see what that plan is? Like, what do you think that that future of Armenia one year, five years on, I don't know, one month on currently looks like? To those individuals that are constantly pushing that, hey man, let's not be divisive. Then you know what's done is done essentially, however egregious that is. Um, let's keep going now. Yeah, I mean, th this is actually where you see a very a distinct difference between the uh, the, the philosophies uh, within Armenian society. Uh, there is one philosophy that believes that Armenia should, Armenia and the Armenian nation uh, should be strong. They should be assertive. They should be uh, constantly working to uh, steal themselves or steal itself against uh, 
actual enemies that we know are enemies and that will remain our enemies, uh, at least for the foreseeable future. And then there's a, a school of thought that, uh, you know, uh, proposes that uh, Armenians should essentially uh, subject themselves to whoever it is, you know, who uh, imposes themselves on Armenia, right? Whether it's the Turks, um, uh, which they've which they've done for you know, uh, you know, at least a hundred years, um, or now as we can see with the Russians, right? And that's one of the misconceptions among uh, the or about the people in the first group is that they're you know they're Russophiles. It's not that they're Russophiles, you know, myself included. It's not that that we're Russophiles. It's that we understand that. Uh, we are a, a very small nation. We're a very small nation state. We're not very powerful. Uh, we're not very, uh, we don't have uh, many resources. So we have to manage the relationships that are uh, forced upon us, right? And that's where you see the divergence. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a sort of, um, uh, the, the second group is very defeatist, right? It's that, uh, it's very much like the, the sentiment that many of them have about the genocide. Right. It's that, well, the genocide happened 100 years ago. Uh, you know, we lived with the Turks for a long time. Why don't we just get over it? I mean, we've heard these arguments before and we've heard them for decades. Now they're just uh, being repackaged and uh, uh, reused for what's what, what happened in uh, uh, November uh, or after November, I should say, with not only Turkey, but now also with Azerbaijan. It's like, well, you know, uh, what's done is done, let's move on. Well, <laughs> what's done is not done, right? Because uh, we, have, we have no finality with, with any of it, right? There's, there's been no peace treaty. Maybe there is, right? Maybe, maybe tomorrow there is a peace treaty that this, uh, uh, you know, uh, government which capitulated will sign that nevertheless does not mean that there isn't uh, a museum in Baku celebrating the... Uh, you know, the, the killing of Armenians, right? That still exists, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that Turkey hasn't spent the past hundred years erasing Armenian culture and history from tra the, the traditional Armenian homeland. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's, it, it, you, have to, you have to really, uh, you have to really sort of, uh, you know, shut yourself off from reality in order to accept that argument and understandably the question here being is right what are we moving on to right are we moving mm -hmm. on without Artsakh are we moving on with the loss of Sunni are we moving on with the loss of the entire statehood within kind of the uh, are we essentially like a client state of you know Azerbaijan slash Turkey that is the question that I want somebody from uh, not you of course somebody from the kind of discerning point of view explain to us in the diaspora in armenia proper what is the move on plan you know the you know it, it, that's it's a very good question uh, it's interesting that you ask that question because i asked that question to some of the people that i knew uh, uh who, who then ended up serving in uh, pashinyan's government years ago prior to 2018 I said, you know, you guys talk about revolution day in and day out. You know, this this wasn't new. I mean, it wasn't. It was definitely not new in 2018 that they, you know, were 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 uh, yearning for a revolution. They worked toward it and they had talked about it for a long time. So I asked them, right? I just asked them straight up. I said, if a revolution were to happen, what is what happens on on day zero, right, or day one? Uh, what happens the day after? The, the revolution takes place and you succeed. And the answer was always the same. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And it's like, well, that, that, that's, a, that's a really flippant response to, to something like uh, uh, a, you know, a political upheaval that is going to change the lives of millions of people. You can't, you can't uh, behave that way, right? With, with lives and frankly, and unfortunately, quite unfortunately, we've seen the attitude, that same attitude uh, manifest itself in what's happened after November 9th, right? We have tens of thousands of people who have been displaced, who have lost their homes, who had to leave 
in a matter of weeks, they had to leave not only their belongings and their homes, but had to leave the graves of their forefathers and the, you know, the cemeteries and the monuments to their, to their uh, fathers and brothers uh, who died in the first Artsakh war. And the, the attitude is just sort of like, well, what's done is, well, no, not what's, what's done is not done for those people. Right. And those people are our brethren. They are our compatriots. And we have a responsibility to them. I, I well said. Um, that's actually, you know, I can't believe sometimes when we're having these conversations, I can't believe we're actually in that cycle right now. And that, that there are those, those advocates trying to essentially, you know, uh, you know, I'm a person that likes to move forward. We're called Arash Media, for God's sake, because we wanted to you know, <laughs> perpetuate the forward thinking news. Right. But it's not forward thinking when we are leaving some behind. You know what I mean? Like that is not the idea behind this. Um, so I appreciate you uh, saying that. Um, and, you know, one day if someone has the, the desire from the discerning point of view to actually spell out what that roadmap is, we're all here to listen, critique and definitely push back on. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for your work on this, William. The, the, and by the way, the, the link is in the chat, excuse me, in the feed, by the way, uh, the article, Foreign Money in Armenia. Um, uh, it's from the Armenite, uh, the story of foreign money in Armenia that is on the thread now. Uh, pivoting a little bit, William, uh, talking about the election and so on, uh, but it's also related at the same time. What are your thoughts on this? Would you say that there, or actually just a simple question, is there a push are we seeing a push from the current administration to silence the opposition media? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I wrote a little bit about this on, on my Facebook page. And uh, so what had happened, I think it was on June 8th. So it was actually before the election, there was an announcement that uh, this media outlet called media.am, which is itself a project of the Media Initiative Center, which is itself, uh, you know, one of the one of the top uh, recipients of foreign funding in Armenia. I, I doubt most people know about it, but if you follow the media in Armenia or media issues, I should say in Armenia, you would be familiar with it because they have uh, sort of like a, a studio that they've built where they try to, you know, where they bring in a lot of the people that are involved with them to to have uh, discussions. In any case. There was an announcement that Media AM, which is a project, like I said, of Media Initiative Center, the, the foreign funded uh, um, media NGO, uh, was uh, uh, allowed to participate in uh, Facebook fact checking of Armenian news outlets in collaboration with Fact Check uh, Georgia, which is also itself uh, funded by foreign money by the National Endowment for Democracy. And I believe the European Union, but don't quote me on the second one. Um, and they together would be determining whether or not, uh, you know, news is or isn't fake in Armenia. Uh, and what would happen is if somebody were to, you know, log on to Facebook and visit the, the sites of certain uh, uh, you know, news outlets or, or you know, see certain uh, postings from certain news outlets, uh, these guys would be able to determine whether or not that should uh, come with a warning uh, as to whether or not that, that uh, news outlet or that piece um, is fake. Now, we've already, and we, so we actually already saw this playing out where uh, of several opposition news outlets and, you know, ones that are not, you know, look, I am, I, I have been following the media in, and media, media issues in Armenia for a long time. There's a lot of garbage out there. There is a lot of garbage out there. Uh, lots of tabloids, lots of outlets that are created and disappear very quickly. Um, lots of them like, you know, uh, Nigel Pashinyan's uh, 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 newspaper for a long newspapers, I should say, you know, uh, publishing things for money, that sort of thing. We're, uh, we're talking about this, this very significant effort, uh, or I mean, reportedly, I mean, that's, that's uh, what a lot of people have claimed, I should say about about Pashinyan's outlet, I uh, uh, don't have any personal experience with it. But 
these outlets, like uh, ones, you know, 168 hours, Harapara, uh, Jovurt, like large uh, media outlets had warnings on their Facebook pages, you know, warning people about, about liking the page. Now, what's interesting here is that it's not being done directly by the government, but, but uh, these are people who have worked in Congress uh, with, uh, in Congress as an, in conjunction with, with, uh, with uh, uh, Nikol Pashinyan or his allies for a very long time. So, uh, and, and, you know, it would be very unlikely for uh, Pashinyan himself or the government to, to be doing it themselves. So it seems like they're doing it, you know, through a third party, which, which is affiliated with them. Uh, as I described, I think in that Facebook post, I mean, you have to, you have to really take a look at the connections. And, uh, you know, one of the things in that article that I wrote was, was a map actually that I had worked on uh, sort of trying to map out the, the network. Uh, it's, it's an incomplete map, if you can believe it. And there's a lot more that could have been added there, but um, you know, you see these connections. So the media initiative center, for example, uh, has supported Civilitas foundation, which uh, is the, the sort of the umbrella organization uh, of, of civil net and civil net itself has uh, sent you know, and that they didn't send them, but, you know, former employees uh, and affiliates of civil net have several people in uh, the Pashinyan government, including very high level officials like Armen Grigorian, who is the secretary of the National uh, Security Council. Uh, you have Mane uh, Gevorkian, who is the, the spokeswoman for Pashinyan himself uh, and who conducted one of the post-war interviews with him. I don't know if any of you saw that. Uh, I think there's a well, there is another person who was a, a longtime civil net reporter who is a member of parliament from Pashinyan's party. So the connections are there. They might not be evident from the surface, but uh, it seems like those uh, wheels have started rolling. Um, amazing. To, mean, sil to, to silence opposition media. I mean. Well, we, yeah. we, you know, we hope that, you know, that there, there isn't any kind of, uh, obviously there, there is a little bit of efforts to do that, but we hope that it doesn't come to full fruition. I mean, yeah. let's see, speaking of, uh, of us seeing that happening full time, essentially like yellow journalism and fake news, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about, you know, what we saw during the 44 days, right? We all here in diaspora, you know, for lack of no better channel to to reach out to literally lived and breathed by the words of Arturun Hawanisian and Shunshan Arutunian, right? And that mm -hmm. was um, that was like a, like a, a, a essentially a deliberate plan of misleading what's going on. Wouldn't you say that? Is it, it because understanding what's going on and then seeing what happened versus what was being told to us via news briefings was just an insane juxtaposition of lies. Yeah, that was that was a very difficult period because. Uh, uh, for some of us uh, who were, were, you know, following it very closely, I mean, I was I was translating a lot of the stuff that uh, pretty much everything that Arthurun and and Shushan were putting out uh, on Facebook as, in real time as much as I could, and uh, while concurrently following, you know, the news that I was getting from the ground, um, also following, of course, third party reports. Uh, of what was happening outside of the Armenian government. Uh, and the situation on the ground seemed to be very different than what was being reported by Arjun and, and Shushan. And, you know, we, we, we tried to hold the line, uh, you know, and everybody sort of, even people in the opposition like myself, you know, people who had, who have, have there, you know, there's, there's no love lost between us and, and, and the Pashinyan government. And we made no secret about that over the past, you know, in the, in the two years prior to the war, uh, two and a half years prior to the war, but all of that was put aside and we, you know, we tried to uh, present a united front. Uh, in retrospect, you, you know, it's, it, frankly, it was not surprising to me, right, that that is what was going on because I am familiar with uh, Pashinyan's work. I'm uh, familiar with how these guys operate I've, I've, I've done a lot of research on Pashinyan himself, right? And his uh, character, his reputation, the, the work that he's done for decades. So it's not at all surprising to me that the government that he led had adopted and implemented a policy uh, of deception, right? It was 44 days of 
just pure deception in every way, shape, and form. And that's unfortunately one of the things that we're going to have to reconcile with and also uh, deal with in the future because when you destroy the trust between the government and the people, right, it's one of the most difficult things to uh, 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 resuscitate. And unfortunately, this is something that he was heavily engaged in, him and the people in his government were heavily engaged in for decades prior to coming, coming to government and uh, something that they continued essentially doing uh, while in government. And there's, there seems to be no sense of responsibility, right, in this, that, you know, there might, there's going to be someone coming after you. And when those people come after you, right, they have to deal with whatever you, you give to them. And if they don't trust anything that, that's coming out of the government's mouth, then that's seriously problematic. But it's also something that, that, that plays well into, into their plans, apparently. So seemingly, right, we, we, we think that, that those were mistakes, but in reality, what was happening, what was fed to us, to the world is via social media, was essentially planned lies. That's the way I kind of... Uh, I agree. I, I, Let me, uh, look, how, how is it like, um, for example, one of the things that I was, I was um, following online was uh, the, inv the advance of Azari troops uh, based on geolocation. Right. Uh, this is this is open source uh, geolocated uh, um, maps that showed where the Azeris were at any given time. Right. Uh, whenever possible, obviously, some of it was speculative, but most of it was was actually geolocated based on uh, pictures and video that was being released by the Azeri side. Now, you know what was what was going on was uh, Arthrun was telling us that certain things were happening or not happening for that matter, when we, we had essentially evidence that those things were happening. What's worse, actually, right, we can say, well, okay, we didn't want to take uh, what the Azeris were saying at face value. What's worse is that there was a lot of Armenian information coming out, right? Armenians were saying, whether they were soldiers or commanders or, or even civilians, were saying, okay, guys, this is happening we need help here, we need, um, uh, uh, you know, things are going south here, whatever it is. And whatever we were hearing from Arthur was was contradicting that. Uh, so how is it that, that, that some of us were, were supposedly better informed about what was happening on the ground and the official uh, spokesperson of the, the war didn't have any idea about it? Yeah. Is that possible? Is that actually possible? Yeah. You know, like I heard just last night uh, from a very uh, well-respected uh, leader in the global Armenian community, I, I won't name names, uh, that the government knew that they could not, they could not win, potentially. They, 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 they're, there's, there's a scenario where they knew that, but then they went ahead anyway. They they kept the propaganda, we're winning, we're winning. Um, and then here we are now, and there's still POWs, and they're still finding bodies, uh, very sadly, in the fields. Um, it's, Look, I mean, uh, uh, David, in the first week of October, they were, I mean, Pashinyan was told, was told that, you know, things aren't going well. If, if this continues, it's going to be bad. And uh, he kept on going. Right? And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was, there was two different opportunities, solid opportunities, to stop the war with Russian uh, mediation, by the way. Yeah. And both of those were rejected. And he himself actually addressed it in one of the post-war interviews saying that uh, my concern was that if I, if I agreed to stop the war and, and accepted the losses that had taken place thus far, that they would call me a traitor. Right. So this is, this is the sort of uh, uh, psychology uh, of the person who is leading the country. Right. He was, he was, more willing when when he was being told by not only uh you know the russians right but also the the military brass we're talking about the the the, the, the chief of staff of the um the military right uh, the equivalent of the joint chief of staff right only gasparian um that the war needs to be stopped 
and it needs to be stopped yesterday. And he keeps saying, uh, no, uh, we're going to keep going. Uh, you know, if we don't keep going, then it's going to look bad for me. You know, his concern isn't about the thousands of kids that he's sending to die under drones. At that point, it was already clear the type of warfare that was being right. uh, implemented by the by the Azeris. And it was already clear that there was heavy Turkish involvement uh, uh, on the ground. Right. Right. And uh, mind you, there's there's another uh, factor here, which is that there were numerous warnings that there was a war uh, that was being prepared by the Turks and Azeris prior to it actually starting, which was seemingly neglected completely by the Pashinyan government, right? Yeah. So uh, it's disconcerting to put it lightly. Yeah. yeah and there's there's tidbits of evidence, right? Of the, of the essentially like, it seems that, you know, oh, well, my hands are tied where we know we got to keep going, right? But then there's also serious like policy evidence that if you are sober you can look back and go oh but why did you do that for example we were talking about we need russia to step in we need russia to step in but your very first uh uh stance that you take as a foreign minister is you fly to washington dc and give an interview to the atlantic council the council that was set up to be essentially anti-russian like i mean we need to really really process these yeah, things yeah. you know what i mean yeah pandering um, to the west yeah. did not help did not, did help, not us. help at all yeah uh, look, real quick, uh, getting towards the, the end of the discussion, uh, William, thank you so much for, for being on with us and staying up uh, fairly late with us here. Uh, I believe you're in L.A., uh, right, William? You're in L.A.? Yes. Yeah, okay, very good. So let's pivot just a little bit to the elections now. Share with us your thoughts. You know, look, your thoughts on the elections, uh, the, the recent June 20th snap elections, uh, you know, wh what appears to be uh, a, a landslide victory for Pashinyan, but not as much of a landslide as 2018. We want, we do want to note that. Uh, your thoughts on the election and then the opposition's current challenges in the constitutional court for the validity of that, of this election. Just to, if you could share some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I would uh, personally not characterize it as a, as a landslide. It, it, it looked like it was going to be a landslide initially, but uh, over time it uh, went down pretty significantly. So he got a little bit, you know, over 50% of the vote. I think it was 53.9, mm -hmm. 53.8. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, so yeah. it, it was around that. Uh, and we know that there was there was uh, discrepancies or there were discrepancies, right? I mean, I was documenting them as they were coming in uh, throughout the day, throughout the election day. There was all sorts of illegal activities, like you know, flyering um, outside of uh, polling stations, which is which is not allowed. I mean, it's not allowed in any uh, uh, you know functioning democracy, and uh, just really egregious violations like that. Um, we had you know ballot box that were not properly stored or were not properly uh, sealed. Uh, we know that post-election, there was a lot of problems where you know, certain votes weren't uh, counted. For example, the, the votes for the Armenia Alliance, the highest on Dashink, um, were, were much lower than they uh, were after the recount. Uh, so we, we know that there, 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 were, there were a long list of problems that uh, you know, don't reflect well on the uh, the election and you know put the put the results of the election under question um, so i i don't take the uh, results of the election at face value i think there's a lot of problems there and i think that it would be it would be misguided to uh, conclude that he won fair and square right uh, mm. that said he obviously got some votes, right? Like he, there, there's, there, you can sure, you know, may, you know, maybe he uh, uh, did some sort of uh, shady activity to uh, put him over the edge. But the fact of the matter is that there were people who voted for him. We know that people voted for him. They, they said so openly. Uh, and the way that I respond to that is, look, if you have spent 25 years and, and millions upon millions of dollars convincing people of a certain thing, right? Things like, for example, Robert Kocharian 
has uh, stolen billions of dollars from the country, even though the, the GDP of the country was like the amount that he stole, all right, uh, uh, at the time while the country itself was improving uh, significantly, uh, or things like, you know, Ser Sarkisian, um, you know, sold Artsakh, you know, just lies, right? Lie upon lie upon lie. And you've been doing that for 25 years uh, uh, with the funding of all these foreign uh, organizations and governments. Uh, it's very difficult to overturn that and to change people's minds in a matter of nine months or even three years, right? And that's essentially, I think, what happened, right? Is the, the dividends of what um, was invested in Armenia for, for about 25 years uh, paid off wonderfully for Pashinyan in the June election because he was able to reap uh, the the uh, the rewards of that and we saw that actually very uh, clearly during the election campaign where he presented absolutely no policy agenda right he yeah, talked other about than, nothing. other than a hammer rather than a hammer. right so he talked about uh, he held he held up a hammer he talked about um you know bringing the bringing the pain essentially right to to, the, to, to everybody who opposed him uh, he talked about the Nachkins, the you know the pe people who came before and that was the extent of his campaigning now how can you run a campaign like that and expect people to vote for you well you can run a campaign like that and expect people to vote for you when you know that these people have a framework in their minds that you yourself have, have, have cultivated and based on a certain uh, set of terms that you use, they will automatically uh, you know, respond in a certain way. And I wrote something about this uh, a few months ago. Okay, there's, there's a, a, a Pavlovian response okay, to certain terms in the Armenian uh, political discourse. And one of them is actually Kochadian, right? You say Kochadian. Okay, you have a certain visceral response on the part of uh, many, many people, okay, who automatically will recount all the sins that they believe that Kocharyan is guilty of. Of course, when you press them, they're very rarely, um, um, almost ever, uh, are able to present you with any sort of uh, substantive evidence, right? It's all right. hearsay. It's all like, you know, everybody knows about it. But the fact of the matter is that that is a very powerful tool when you're trying to convince somebody to pick you over over the guy that you've demonized for a very long time. And that's exactly what happened. As far as the you know the opposition's opportunities uh, go uh, in the constitutional court, the you know the upside there is that this is the same constitutional court which effectively rejected the you know, the kangaroo court that was created to try uh, Robert Kocharian. Uh, they, they said that, you know, it was, um, it, it was essentially a trial that needed to end. Um, so there's a little bit of hope there. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be enough to, uh, you know, overturn the election results. Um, I would, of course, hope that it is because I don't believe that, uh, like I said, Pashinyan won fair and square. And I think that the Armenian people deserve to have an honest election that is uh, preferably run by a, a neutral body that is not beholden in any way uh, uh, to Pashinyan. But that's one of the benefits of being in, in such a system, right? If you have uh, control over the levers of power, uh, then you're going to use those levers of power uh, in whatever way, shape and form is uh, available to you in order to hold on to power and it, you know it's something that happens everywhere and it happened in Armenia and sometimes it happens in more egregious ways than others and um, that's uh, why we are where we are today yeah yeah it's a difficult situation for us to be in it's hard to watch from so far away uh, but we're going to keep we're going to just keep watching keep paying attention to it and and support how we can um william where do you see and we could we could probably wrap with with this question perhaps 
where do you see the opposition movement in Armenia taking the government in the near future? I know that's a big question, uh, but you know, there's even the the Hayastan uh, Dashnik, Greco uh block, is even questioning whether or not they're going to take parliamentary seats. I don't think it makes sense for them not to, right? They want to make sure that they have some kind of presence in the parliament. But where do you see the opposition movement in Armenia taking the government in the near term and perhaps uh, maybe in the, a little bit longer term? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, from what I understand, uh, they might not want to take the mandates is because uh, it's unclear what would happen in that case. So mm -hmm. if uh, the, you know, the party that, that received mandates doesn't actually take their seats, uh, it might actually trigger a constitutional crisis, which would require uh, uh, another election. I'm not sure if that is actually what would happen. Who knows? Maybe it's something uh, that they're discussing. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, the, the benefit, actually, um, the silver lining, if we can call it that, and I don't know if uh, it's going to materialize in the way that, I'm, that I envision it, is that at, at the very least, at the very, very least, with the election of Hayastan Dashing, uh, which includes, of course, Robert Kocharian, or, which is led by Robert Kocharian, but also includes the Armenian Revolutionary Federation and uh, Veratsanvog Hayastan, which is the, uh, you know, uh, Armenia Resurrection uh, Party uh, or Reborn Armenia Party, uh, depending on how you translate it, um, as well as the um, which includes the Harapetagan party, the Republican party, and also uh, the Haidenik party, which is, which is Arthur Van Etzian's party. The, the benefit there is you actually have a real opposition in parliament, right? So if they actually take their seats, right, right um, quite unlike the first two and a half years of Pashinyan's rule, right, where you had essentially yes men uh, in parliament in the uh in, in in the in the shape of um the Bargawach Hayastan, the prosperous Armenian party and Lusavur uh, Hayastan, which was Edmund, Edmund Marukian's party, uh you're you know which, which essentially rubber stamped everything that, that Pashinyan wanted to do under the guise of uh, you know being uh, some sort of opposition. Uh, now you have people in there who are actually opposed to uh, Pashinyan, who are actually opposed to his uh, policy agenda, not necessarily what he discussed during the election, but you know whatever he's planning on doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and one other uh, benefit is that these are people who have experience in parliament, right? Uh, who are very well versed in uh, the ways of government, right? Uh, Kocharyan obviously led the government for 10 years the ARF is um, or has a lot of experience in, in in the government, in parliament, and also in ministerial positions, uh, as does, of course, the um, the Harapetagan Party, uh, led by Serge Sarkisian. So these are people who who know the ins and outs of government. They've they've been on committees. They'll be on committees again. Uh, they know how the parliament works. They know you know parliamentary uh, procedure. They have connections with uh, the forces. Um, you know, throughout the country, and uh, they, I think, will, if they take their seats, um, be a force to be reckoned with. Unfortunately, you know, Pashinyan still leads the government, it's not a coalition, so uh, he is going to be able to push a lot of things um, down everybody's throat, uh, as they've done, uh, but it's going to be a lot more difficult. It's going to be a lot more difficult. And, 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 and the other big benefit uh, here is that he doesn't have a constitutional majority, which is essentially right. the, you know, what, what's called in America, the super majority, right? Where he would be able to yeah. essentially do, with, do, do whatever he wants without any sort of opposition, exactly. which he doesn't have. So yeah, that's he also- He needed 54, he needed 54%. Right. Yeah. Essentially 53.92 or something that he came, yeah. he came out with. It's really interesting. So that's- How coincidental, point. right? Right, yeah. okay, right. Um, and it's also also something to like think about. It's almost unprecedented, right? Where like we've seen uh, blunders in other countries' histories past, right? Um, you know, when Japan lost, the entire you know upper echelon was you know 
uh, resigned uh, or did you know some sort of an honorable harakiri. I'm not saying suggesting that. Um, uh, you know, even the Cameron government, with the blunder of the Brexit, he bowed out and said, "I can no longer continue," even though the Conservative government came on. I, it's 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 odd to me to see that the same person that seemingly uh, whatever was bestowed this loss of a war. I'm being, you know, uh, uh, I'm joking here, of course, right? But still continues on. Um, I'm not saying let's, you know, get rid of all of the my step people, although, you know, it's a, that's a dream of mine. But, you know, for, for the most part, um, my step without Nicole would be at least a step forward, you know? Um, it's just, I haven't seen this before in, yeah. in the recent history, at least. Yeah, uh, look, these are, these are people who have, uh, and this, for you know, on this on this front, I am speaking from personal experience. It, uh, unfortunately, uh, very little self-respect. Right, you have to have a sense of dignity, and you have to have a sense of honor uh, in order to realize and recognize that you made a serious mistake, if that's what it was, uh, that you have led your country and your countrymen down. Uh, uh, a dark path, right, which is going to make their lives, it has already made their lives a living hell and will in all likelihood make their lives uh, very difficult in the foreseeable future. And, you know, if you have some dignity and you have some honor, you remove yourself from that situation, you bow out and you say, and you apologize profusely for the rest of your life. Right. So the, the, the comparison with, uh, uh, you know, the Japanese post-World War II, I think, you know, I, I myself made that comparison, uh, you know, in a post that I wrote on Facebook. But I also, if I'm not mistaken, noted there that it's, it's just incomparable, right? Because those people, uh, whoever they were, and, you know, many of them were, were not good people, to be frank, right? There's many of those Japanese yeah. uh, commanders were, were really... Uh, violent uh, people who did terrible things during the war. But uh, all that said, they had a sense of honor, right? That uh, they let, or when I should say, they let their people down, right? By losing, right? They, they, they sensed that they no longer deserved to be before them, to be a part of them, to be among them, which is why they ultimately performed, uh, uh, you know, ritual uh, seppuku or harakiri um, mm -hmm. and left. And, you know, they're not, the, you know, that's not the only option, of course. That's, that's, that's one, uh, that's, that's one, that's one way of doing it. The other one is just resigning and going and, and, uh, yeah, exactly. you know, retiring somewhere. <laughs> yeah, hence, right. hence the Cameron example. Like, yeah, one was right. World War II. Military. Well, I mean, Cameron, Cameron didn't lose a war, but exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think, uh, there, there are other examples, but I think there, that was probably also on their minds, right? They, they, rec they, they also, you know, understood that they would have to answer lots of questions, and they're still going to answer lots of questions. You know, I, want to, I want to emphasize this point. It's not over, right? This is not over. Uh, this election was was a blip, right? They will not remain in power forever, and there's going to be a time where they will have to answer for the things that they did, for the decisions that they made, and they will be held accountable for these things. And it happens uh, in, in all of these contexts. Sometimes it happens in a short period of time, right? Uh, uh, as it happened in you know, Norway with the collaborationists uh, uh, there with Quisling and, uh, and, and others. And sometimes it takes long periods of time, right? Until, you know, who knows? Generations change. I don't think they're going to last that long. I, I think it'll be relatively short term. And they recognize that. So they did whatever they needed to do to, to essentially plan for their future. And this election was was their way out, at least temporarily. Yeah. Um, but not permanently. Well, you know, one can hope. Um, we'll obviously be here to make sure to continue the conversation, obviously, right? Um, William, I just, uh, you know, there's so much we can talk about. There's so many more things that we can discuss. Um, I mainly want to thank you for, you know, taking the time 
ex, you know, giving, giving the opportunity for those. That I want to thank the, the viewers for li listening, taking yeah. the time out of your day. That means that you care because the point of all of this is to get educated, to kind of regurgitate a lot of the very, very, very hard topics and ideas and things that are happening in diaspora, predominantly Armenia. And let's never, ever, you know, uh, keep our pulse on Artsakh, you know, the flag behind me. Uh, because for me personally, I'll just speak, uh, you know, in, in terms of what I, the way I think, Artsakh's, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the movement for Artsakh was the first time the Armenian nation took a step forward, rather than constantly kind of coming into that whole, you know, the death blows of genocides, pogroms, you know, being pushed out of here, there, you know, civil wars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, we need to make sure that, you know, the, the, uh, the, what's happening to Artsakh is at the forefront of what we do in Yerevan, in the diaspora, Stepan Akep, of course. Um, and I thank you for joining us. I thank you for having you know, the, 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 the time to have this conversation. I would definitely want to extend an invitation for you to come. Again, there's so much more that we can. Absolutely. Um, Anytime. Yeah. And uh, thank, thank you to all the listeners. And uh, thank you guys for organizing this. I really appreciated uh, the conversation. It was great. Great to talk to you guys for the first time. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully not the last. And uh, I wish you all the best with Audach Media. I'd love to see uh, new media outlets, uh, you know, fresh faces, fresh ideas out there. I think it's absolutely necessary. And I think uh, you guys are doing great work. So I, I wish you the best. And uh, I look forward to our future discussions. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you so, so much, William. Yeah, you're definitely a friend of the show. We're grateful to have you. And uh, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Good night. All right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow, David. Wow, a lot, a uh, lot covered there, man. A lot, a lot, uh, a lot to unpack for a long time. Um, but uh, you know, thanks for bringing him to the show, Greg, and I think our our good friend and top fan, Ada, as well for uh, for his help. I think too, bringing him in. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, like there's there's a lot of, you know, a lot of questions. Uh, first of all, everyone that's on, everyone that came in to view, um, obviously wanted to hear the conversation that was being had. Um, I appreciate the interest. Um, you know, you can stay, you know, definitely welcome to stay on. David and I are going to go through a couple of, you know, pertinent news items. Um, but yeah, yeah man, I got I to gotta unpack. Oh, a little uh, major announcement. Uh, you know, we have, you know, our producer, third man on the, in the show, Richard, obviously you can see. He's not here with us right now. Um, he had he had he had serious serious technical difficulties, and you know after you know a little uh, uh, you know trial and error, we just decided that he's just gonna bow out for tonight. But Rich, no, yeah, no um, you know you're with us, and we're we're gonna kind of reassemble yeah. and move forward. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do our best uh, to produce uh, like like he does so uh, flawlessly, so seamlessly uh, every week for us. So um, yeah. Um, for those of you that are interested, you know, obviously we're like, we're a small media, um, you know, entity trying to grow, you know, um, if you enjoyed what you saw today, and if you enjoy what you're about to see more uh, of today, uh, please, uh, you know, like us on all of our channels, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube, um, we go live via Zoom through this platform at 9pm, whenever technology permits uh, at the right time. Um, so if you enjoyed today, um, if you want to continue the conversation, um, if there's anything you want to pitch, you can always reach out to myself, David and Richard. We're always, uh, you know, checking this, uh, the, the, the platform on Facebook, on Instagram. And I don't know if there's messaging on YouTube, but if there is, you can message you, us there as well. Comment, um, yeah, comment, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can always, yeah, you can always reach us. You can pitch ideas to us if you'd like. Uh, we'll definitely consider it. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being interested enough to, uh, uh, to, you know, educate yourself on these uh, important topics. All right, David, exactly. let's, uh, we, you know, there's yeah. a lot, you know, there's a lot. We yeah, can, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot. lot. There's a lot to, there's a lot to get through. We're going to do the best we can to get through it as quickly as possible. Um, and then anything we're not able to get to, uh, like Rich always uh, shares every week, we'll, we'll definitely uh, post the links in the feed if we're not able to get to it. Uh, but regardless, the links will be in the feed, whether we cover it on air or not. Uh, Greg, why don't we go ahead and get started um, with, uh, you know, the removal of a, yet another key Armenian general, this time in the Tabush region. Uh, that, that news, I think, coming out today or yesterday, right, uh, very recently. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. there was a, there's obviously, there's the, the you know, the, the, the general's name is Grigory Kachaturov, right? He is a, here, let me see, let me see, I'll try to, 
share my screen this way. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, the general is he, he so a couple of things to mention about that will be very brief. He, you know, what we saw preambling to the war in September, there was the issue of what was going on in Tabush in July, right? So this was actually the 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 general of the Third Army Corps. Uh, it's it's a, it's one third of Armenia's armed forces, right? He is uh, responsible for the Tabush region, and he literally was the the, the person under whose watch. Uh, there were a little bit of, uh, you know, we gained a few, a little bit of ground in that skirmish in July. Yeah. Currently, he is being uh, sacked. It is said that he's being moved to, um, to possibly a desk job. What's going to happen to this general is not, is not understandable at the moment. However, it happening right now is a little bit suspect, and uh, uh, it's, it questions everyone's curiosity. I know, David, you mentioned what is going on, why the moving of this individual currently. There are a few speculations, but it is very questionable. Why? Yeah, well, and then the reports are very, very just bare bones, right? It's just saying, hey, this happened. The president signed it. That's it. Uh, okay, why? And yes, and, and Greg, you know, if you recall, like it was it was definitely a little, it was more than a skirmish that happened in Tabush, right? They, it was their Azeri elite forces, quote unquote, trying to incur, and again, Tabush, being the northeast uh, territory of Armenia proper. This was not Artsakh. We still had Artsakh at that time. Um, and, you know, we do, again, we, we do have Artsakh. We so. do still have 20% of what we had, right, of Artsakh. Yes, we do still. For the time being. For the time being, exactly. Yeah. So, again, this is just exactly, exactly. It's kind of weird right after the snap elections. Why? Uh, who knows? We'll have to keep an eye on that. Um, you know, actually something, why don't we uh, pivot to, the elections, right, right, Greg. You know, we were talking about it with, uh, with William, um, uh, at at some length as well. Um, and yeah, uh, Greg, if you could share screen, that would be great. And if any any link, you let me know, and, and I'll share as well. But the, uh, we're seeing four now, four of the opposition forces, no longer just Hayastan Dashnik, uh, or Kocharian's bloc, who initially was challenging the election we're now seeing four of the opposition parties challenging the election of course these other groups much much smaller uh, minority um, forces right or more, more uh, opposition forces but this is notable right it's it's now a much larger group of uh, the opposition that is challenging and asking for the elections to be annulled um, and here we are. Uh, the election saga continues. Uh, of course, you wouldn't th know it's a saga based on what's happening um, on the streets there, right? And based on Pushinian still in power and having been re reelected. But this is happening on the back end. Uh, the quote from uh, from them is that they submitted a twelve point motion to the constitutional court with a detailed analysis of one hundred nine polling stations documentary evidence this will be the first such dispute considered in the constitutional court after the uh, after the adop adoption of amendments to the law on the constitutional court in 2018 that was uh aram vardevanyan uh, who's a representative of the armenian alliance uh, at a press conference um last friday um so they have a 12 point motion they put forth we're gonna to have to keep our eyes on that, Greg. Yeah, and it's, and it's yeah, it's a great, uh, great, great idea to kind of explain to you know the viewers, the listeners. Again, we mentioned we spoke with our guests previously about the 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 plethora of people immediately jumping to let's move on. Well, democracy operates in such a way that there's checks and balances, and there's legal ways of challenging certain things, right? So if we are all pro democracy, as the move on committee is uh, uh, seemingly so. Um, everything that this uh, these this opposition coalition is doing is essentially uh, challenging uh, uh, the the uh, results of the election legally and rightfully through the constitutional court. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Now, the one thing I'll add to wrap up the election talk. Look, yes, they have these mo they have this, these twelve point motions. They had the 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 six um, uh, things that they they put out on the election night. The uh, they being the opposition. William gave his view on it as well again just to be objective greg literally for that purpose while we're on air the official monetary organizations all said that the election was well run 
with the exception of the inflammatory rhetoric and uh, things that happened during the campaign. So the, yeah, the turning off of the lights was also a little concerning. Uh, yeah, that's very odd as well. Yes. The power outages, the precincts. So let's see, we'll see where this goes. We'll keep our eye on it, obviously, and we're going to keep reporting on it. So yes. Um, Greg. Next up is obviously the, uh, the, the, the big, the big, uh, the news of the deployment of Russian troops to essentially yes. Um, what is it called? The thwart or the calm down or the pushback, the current presence of a thousand true or Azeri troops in Armenia. There's other things that ha are resulting uh, with, uh, with that, the harassment of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, shepherds the, and the local population. But the biggest news is that Russian troops to be deployed in Gerhard Kunik. And I apologize, this is a, you know, a site I believe is going through a, um, an update in the multimedia is not showing, but no, the no idea is that uh, Russian troops will now be stationed in the Arapunik region, and they are asking for the move back or the withdrawal of both Azeri and Armenian troops from the border regions. Um, a lot of the times the issues we've, remember we're covering things that are happening in Sunik and Gerarpunik, right? The harassment of the shepherds, the farmers, the, um, the, you know, the harassment of the populations there, you know, hopefully this can slowly come to an end with the presence of a foreign entity at the moment. Um, yeah, hopefully. You know, I again, another thing where I'm questioning the timing, Greg, like why didn't this happen in May or June? You know, this has been since May 12. Okay, this May 12, they incurred, the, the number kept growing. Like you said, it's a thousand now. Uh, I just don't understand why now. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting how, okay, snap elections are done and now... Russian peacekeepers are coming in on the Armenian border as well and get Unique. They already had some in Sunik as well uh, to, to stop this. There's a quote from the Russian ambassador uh, saying, as you know, Russian, the Russian ambassador in Yerevan, Sergei Koprikin, as you know, Russian border guard posts have been deployed at various sections of the Armenian Azerbaijani border. They are keep, they're helping to keep the situation on the border calm and stable so the local population feels safer. Well, look, the Azeri forces need to leave uh, and this needs to happen right away. Um, and, you know, the, the other items, as you touched on, Greg, are that the Azeri soldiers have stolen uh, things from, from shepherds and from, from, young, from youth in the, on the border region as well, and, and they continue to threaten. There was a skirmish yes. as well that happened. Perhaps we should mention that and then move on to POWs, but the, there was a skirmish where a, one Armenian soldier was injured uh, that did happen. And so we continue to see the provocations, the acts of aggression, and the, the, the provocations and threats to even the local community there. Um, so yeah, it's, it was in an area called Shorja, which is on the lakes, uh, deep into actually Armenia, which is what, what really, really, really kind of uh, scares and bothers me is because, um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll share my Rightfully so. Yeah, I'll to show people where exactly it is. Because again, geography is important. Here is Shorja, right? And this is uh, essentially yeah. Azerbaijan. This is probably even during when, when, when everything was okay and stable, this is probably the thinnest point in the Armenian uh, Republic between Lake Sevan and yeah. uh, the Azeri border. There are high mountains there, but again, the enemy is coming through uh, uh, an area of deep into Armenia. All of the issues we have always talked about in, in Gerar Kunik were around this region right here, right? Verin Shorja. Yeah. Right, right, right here, uh, Verin Shorja and closer to uh, Vardenis. But now it's coming in all the way down into this area. And that is really, really, really concerning. That is just, yeah, I mean. I yeah, know. so these, these Russian border guards can't, can't come soon enough. So it, it just, it, it, it's still, from the reports, it seems like there's no clear timetable on when they're coming. So or they're, they're, they're going to come, but yeah. yeah. Or is yeah. there, is, or is there seemingly no Armenian uh, uh, military at this point? I mean, there's one in name, but I'm just not understanding what's going on. We don't need to hide, you know. We don't need to yeah, hide. Move, move forward. Yeah, it's beyond concerning. Yeah. So, yeah, let's move on to POWs, Greg. I mean, look, July third. You know, while we're getting ready on our our July fourth weekend, um, you know, a lot of news dropped on July third, right, Greg? Uh, and a lot of it had to do with POWs. Uh, and other items we're going to get to, but 15 more POWs were returned to Armenia on July 3rd. That news broke. Um, and again, 
-hmm. And it's the quote from the report is, as a goodwill gesture, the Armenian side once again provided Azerbaijan with maps of minefields in the Fizuli and Zangalan regions. Um, this the is again, regions, yeah, the southern yeah. regions of Artsakh. Uh, um, and uh, again, so the first 15 were given for the landmine maps around the uh, Agdam region, which is right. the front region adjoining in front of Stepanakert. Now there's, it's 90,000 landmines. It's essentially, you know, we're, we're giving back all the all the guardrails uh, around the current uh, citizens of Artsakh, um, and yeah, I mean, you there's really no uh, there's no quantification of the lives that are of the 15 people that are coming back, but also the Geneva Convention states that after the war is over, uh, you just return every single uh, POW without negotiations. Exactly, exactly. Just, and this seems yeah. to be a. Uh, premeditated also the quantification of 15 now 15 later um it's 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 it's, it's very yeah. odd we it's know different. that there was more than 200 there's mm -hmm. still probably close to that if not still more than 200 mm -hmm. and you know how many more bargaining chips if you will do we have to give to only get 15 pow's back every time it just seems completely unacceptable and the fact, and I've said this many times, Greg, in private to you and on air, the fact that this is not a global humanitarian crisis is, yeah. it's is beyond, just beyond, yeah, it's beyond comprehension because you're actually seeing, uh, you know, what the international silencing or the value placed on Armenian lives is. And I would, again, uh, gander to kind of point to the community, again, of people that say, hey, let's move on. Uh, what is your move on plan? Is this it? Are we going to move on this way? Are right. we going to essentially uh, let go of every uh, safety and guardrail or adjoining right. Stepanakert? And then what's going to happen to Stepanakert and Artsakh in general? Um, I would like to know because this right now seems uh, seems like right. seems planned. Doesn't it seem planned a little bit? 15, 15? Oh, absolutely. Bit. Well, look, we know because again, they're so transparent not necessarily even trying to, but there was video that we've shown on this show of Aliyev telling Erdogan, the president of Turkey, yeah. that he has POWs and he has them for, for political reasons. There is no question about that. We know it. We're watching. We're, we're, we're witnessing it happening. Uh, more needs to be done to get these POWs home. Thank God these guys are coming home. And as far as we know, they are healthy and now they are safe. Um, we don't know what kind of mental trauma they've been through, physical, emotional trauma they've been through. We can only imagine what that is. Uh, but these other guys need to get home. And Greg, to keep it moving, right? We don't necessarily need to show the links. We know for a fact, hearing from POWs that just came back, that there are many more POWs still in captivity because they told us so when they got back. So, um, uh, it's unacceptable. It has to, they, they have to get home and it has to happen immediately. Um, you know, keep, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that, Greg, but the. No, I mean, it's just obviously, you know, there's, 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 there's so much to say, but you know, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, I'm uncomfortable uh, with this because again, you're in a position where of course I celebrate the return of every Armenian and we must, must rally around the national community and all those organizations that need to, uh, essentially kind of uh, be, be held to the fire to make sure that the international laws are upheld and everyone is returned without any preconditions. But seems to me that there is this preconceived plan of it's going to keep going until all obstacles of Azerbaijan in Artsakh regions are going to be uh, removed. And at that point, maybe we will see, uh, although, although there are also a few uh, Armenian uh, uh, POWs on trial, which in and of itself is also illegal, right? Yes. So there yes. is Four, no 14 direction. more, 14 There's more no were just- direction. There's no clear anything, I uh, apologize, right? There's no uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the love of God. Right. Um, you know, um, everybody has resigned. Those right. people that we even seemingly criticized here on this show, those folks are no longer there as well. Right. So I don't right. know what the plan is, David. I really don't. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know either, other than we have to keep raising our voices. We have to keep sharing it on social media. We have to keep reporting on here on Arch Media. We have to ask our, our followers and people watching to share it and inform others. You know, look, the, the 
uh, ICRC, International Red Cross, the Russian Peacekeepers, uh, supposedly the OSCE Minsk Group are supposed to be involved with this and making sure that these POWs come home. But to your point, Greg, it appears that they're all going to keep sending piecemeal once they get some sort of leverage from us. But yes, regarding POWs being sentenced illegally or tried illegally, 14 more POWs were just sentenced in Baku as well. Um, and then there was another sham trial of two more POWs, which began in Baku. So they're going to keep doing this, trying some, sentencing some, sending some in jail uh, while bargaining or forcing more concession from us to send back small amounts of POWs as well. It has to stop. Uh, and hopefully the Armenian Legal Center, which has now demanded immediate action by the U.S. and Europe in support of POWs, we hope that that is going to have some impact as well. Thank you to the Armenian Legal Center. Hopefully that 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 brings some movement um, yeah. as well. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. yeah. Greg, to, to keep it moving, Greg, perhaps we should touch on perhaps uh, how Pashinyan, after just being reelected, just met with with Putin. Uh, just yesterday in in Moscow, right? Uh, that that meeting did happen. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, there was the yeah there was a meeting between Putin and Pashinyan where you know as a foreign leader uh, of a foreign government, uh, Putin has a uh, number of times uh, congratulated Pashinyan on his election mm -hmm. results and that he essentially is the head of state that Putin seemingly will be dealing with, um, as well as underscoring um, the the need to soon resolve Armenia sensitive issues. Um, yeah. I'm not I'm not too sure. Uh, again, the, the, the meetings are always behind closed doors. What are those sensitive issues? Is it the POWs? Is it the demarcation of the borders? Is it the horrible corridor that's going to be bestowed over uh, Sunik? Um, there is so much so much sensitivity and horror around what's about to, you know, uh, transpire or, you know, pray to God not that, right. you know, I'm always, always uh, weary and worried about the meetings, even with a country that seemingly supposedly has our back. And, you know, you know, my stance on Russia, you understand. Right. Where well, right. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it, right. Russia, while it's not in their interest to lose Armenia, if you will, or even to lose Artsakh, which is why we see the peacekeepers, heavily uh, there uh, to keep the peace or to enforce security or to have to grow Russia's footprint militarily in the region, right? Like I was, like we were talking about when we were preparing, right, Greg, like it feels like Armenia is becoming more like, like a, a militarized Russian territory, if you will. Uh, now that may be good for the Armenian people of Artsakh and Armenia to ensure their security, but it doesn't seem healthy or like a good long-term solution for the sovereignty of the nation. So, uh, you know, we have to, we have to see uh, where this goes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. That is, that is, that is the predicament we're in. That is the situation we're in. Um, obviously, you know, there's, you know, whatever the stance on Russia is, Armenians globally or not, yo, let's, let's, let's sober up. There's yeah. Russian troops in Armenia. There are no NATO troops right now in Armenia, nor will they ever be. Exactly. You know I mean, there's nothing. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, NATO's NATO. Turkey is the second largest military power in NATO. That's what we need. To, people need to understand that the pandering West, the West is allied with Turkey. Turkey is one of our uh, greatest enemies, if you will. They want us off the earth, uh, just like us. Absolutely, David. Thanks for mentioning that. Therein mm -hmm. is also the notion that. Um, yeah, I don't understand the, the, this desire to kind of, you know, open up all the borders and try to kind of proceed yeah, I with hope. Azerbaijan and Turkey, right. uh, you know, right. uh, essentially buying up the Armenian economy. Those those voices, I just don't get. Um, yeah. One thing we want to mention, but that wasn't a point that we made, but actually shout out to Rich. Rich, if you're, I hope you're watching, man. Uh, um, yeah. uh, sorry, you had some difficulties jumping on. But um, it was also the neighbor to the south has a lot, the, a lot has been happening and we will report on that. There was an election in Iran. There's a lot of political shifting in Iran and what that means for Armenia, we will mention in the, yeah. you know, in the forthcoming episodes. Absolutely. Um, yeah, their election was June 18th, two days before Armenia snap elections, right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, 
Greg, perhaps we should just touch real quickly. I mean, very, very briefly, we don't have to even have to share the article that Armenian officials have criticized the CSTO. Remember, we reported, I think it was last week, the week before, the yeah, yeah. CSTO, which is collective uh, so security treaty organization or something like that, which is the, the collective body of guaranteeing the security of Armenia and the uh, five other former Soviet republics, right? Russia is to guarantee the security of all of these republics. They're criticizing CSTO's lack of response to Armenia's request for help uh, with this Azeri incursion, if you will. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know. This, this, of course, you know, like obviously CSTO is often quoted as the entity that actually forewarned Pashinyan of an impending war, right? Um, yeah. so there was some yeah. usefulness there. Unfortunately, yes, I, I see nothing but the ability to criticize that. Uh, there's yeah. literally articles uh, that are invoked when you as a member state of CSTO, which is a collective, you know, security treaty between yeah. Russia, Armenia, and a few other countries, right? And once you feel threatened by a non a member of the CSTO, you can invoke those articles and seemingly other members should come to your aid. But right. you're getting also this kind of regurgitated uh, rebuttal yeah. stating that um, there is actually no uh, no threat. These are border issues and we would like to deal with them in a safe uh, uh, and kind of right. peaceful manner. Well, I mean, CSTO, there are a thousand uh, you know, uh, foreign troops in Armenia um, is it okay if the, what would we, what would CSTO do if there was a thousand, I don't know, uh, Indian troops in Kazakhstan, you know, is that, yeah, that's a good point. Know? That's a really good point. You and know? if there, if, and if that, uh, organization can no longer react, you know, is it valid? Sorry. There's also another thing, Armenian report reported recently. And I saw that, that apparently Azerbaijan seemingly as usual it, as it will, is flirting with the idea of joining the CSTO. And yeah. what is that going to look like for Armenia? I don't know. Uh, friends, we are in a tough neighborhood, right? Pivoting to the West is not an option. Influencing Russia is our option. Our future, unfortunately, currently for the next 10 years or so is with Russia. So we need to re, you know, refocus our thinking in the yeah. direction of how can we continue with Russia, possibly influence Russia, uh, and jointly with Russia, uh, build build our future. That you know, this yeah. is this is the cards we're dealt. This is where we are. This is the neighborhood we live in. I do not see NATO uh, jumping into Yerevan anytime soon. Don't believe me or David. Look at Georgia. Georgia has been asking to join NATO for years and years and years. It's nowhere near doing that. So, yeah. Nor nor am I advocating towards that either. Yeah. Exactly. Oof, yeah. So much. Uh, you know, there's some. Well, I think we could probably just put some of these links in the uh, a lot of these other links in the feed uh thank you everyone for watching it was getting late here uh i think it's important to mention greg that the europa nostra and the european association of archaeologists have called for the protection of Artsakh cultural heritage sites so it's it i think it's really important to have more voices calling for this is it actually going to make a difference it may not. There's video surfacing of Azeri soldiers shooting um, and graffitiing all over our Hashkars in now occupied Artsakh, uh, Azeri occupied Artsakh. Um, we have to keep raising our voice as well and tagging these organizations on social media, calling our representatives uh, as well to make sure that this is uh, brought more uh, to light. Uh, but thankfully, uh, thank you to those organizations for for calling that out. Um, and perhaps we can pivot back right, to more more local things or just to wrap up our media. If, if I may, there's one yeah. quick item that was from, uh, the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, David Babayan, the, uh, the, the sure. Sure, foreign, sure, sure. foreign minister, since we're on Artsakh, yeah, the, 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 sure. the, the, uh, the uh, photos and the videos of uh, soldiers shooting at the Khachkars is disturbing. And, but, you know, at this point, we know what our uh, neighbors are capable of um, same neighbors that the administration wants to, you know, uh, integrate the economies with. You know, you, you got to keep 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 drilling that for folks to really understand. Yeah, I mean, but, Greg, um, is that is that really officially from Pashinyan, from his cabinet or his party? That's officially their stance. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot now. Um, uh, our, you know, a relative, someone we know closely is part of the administration is a minister of the economy. And that is, yes, that is 
that is the next step. The next step is to, you know, try to open the borders. What do you call it? Un, 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 what do you call it? Unclog the economic in, and the transportation infrastructure in the South Caucasus at the detriment of Armenia's, uh, you know, sovereignty. Why do I say that openly? Sovereignty, because you're going to build a freeway over Sunik. I hope that's not going to happen. We're going to try our best for that not to happen. But that was being pushed. Right. Well, um, remember, that was one of the part of the nine step uh, November nine agreement. Yeah, absolutely. that was part of it. Yeah. And that's why the, the, you know, the last thing we can mention about Artsakh, Artsakh, the most important region in Armenia's current history. Right. Um, David Babayan is uh, actually quoted stating on the future of Kara Artsakh in Azerbaijan, which is something that Aliyev is now pandering. They want Armenia to demarcate the, uh, the borders, essentially rendering Artsakh part of Azerbaijan. The model of existence with Azerbaijan is unacceptable for us. First of all, Azerbaijan itself has shown its inadmissibility. Our people made the right decision to leave Azerbaijan as it was no longer possible to be part of a common union in the, in the state in which Baku had no control over Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast, NKLO, in the back in the Soviet days. Even in the conditions, it was impossible to ensure our security. Moreover, Azerbaijan liquidated the NKLO, showing how it envisions our future. Essentially, uh, uh, Azerbaijan said that there is no NKIO, no more Nagorno-Karabakh, which is going to absorb that territory into regions of Azerbaijan, um, showing how it envisions the future in of Artsakh. Then there were the three wars unleashed by Azerbaijan, and now we see what is happening. By the way, in 1998, and this is quoting what he said, 1998 and 1999, Azerbaijan rejected the idea of a common state where Karabakh and Artsakh and Azerbaijan were theoretically to be equal subject units. Azerbaijan even rejected that idea. That is why it is uh, any attempt to create such a system would lead to a disaster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, mm -hmm. this is important to note because essentially this is the impending wall. It's moving towards us and we need to avoid it at all costs possible because this is what uh um the next step out of baku will be yeah and there's oh. the, the minister david babayan right there yeah um you know i hope there's a lot of talk like even even from pashinyan's camp that the status of artsakh needs to be resolved there will be no con there, there will be no more concessions of territory and so on he Pashinyan's even said there will be no highway over armenia and um, wherever that's going to be but again we have yet to see because he signed that that agreement anyway not to detract from what, what you were just talking about from yeah. from david but by and greg yeah. Um, we're up, yeah we're coming up on the end here um there's obviously yeah. the, the, uh, a little bit of positivity right as we as we wrap the show there's there's something awesome happening in southern california right it's, it's, yeah yeah how about a, how about a couple things well what, okay look before we get to positive maybe well we can make it a positive we definitely should mention uh the passing of a legend right yeah, greg yes. uh mr jivan gasparian the legendary armenian duduk player he passed away it's not clear if it really was on the sixth or not the news broke on tuesday uh rich shared it with us and then greg you found this this very npr article which i'll share right now so everyone can see who we're talking about uh right here uh this, this is jivan gasparian absolute legend on the duduk uh yeah, he is literally known for bringing the duduk sound to the world um because exactly. because of his uh uh what do you call it because of his involvement with musicians uh uh what do you call it uh uh yeah. what do you call it uh, film scores from rock stars to film scores to armenian music uh to armenian sacred music um you know let me see if i could play this just for a second let's see if it works but uh, while while Dave is attempting that, I'll mention something again that Richard said. Yes. Let's see if it works. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? We'll just play a moment of it and then we can move on.
Yeah, so that, yeah, that's actually him with his grandson, uh, Jivon yeah, Gasparian yeah, yeah. Jr., right there, which is really cool. So may he rest in peace um, and prayers to his family. Uh, it seems to be, his legacy seems to be in good hands with his his grandson, Jivon Gasparian Jr., now carrying the legacy uh, of, of him. Uh, and then, Greg, we have 17 Armenian athletes that will be competing in the Tokyo Olympics, which, by the way, the Olympics will have no spectators because again, yet again, we need to be very, very vigilant. Something we haven't talked about in a while is that there is, we are still in a pandemic and yes. there are still the, you know, uh, emerging variants that are really ravaging through the world. Um, Armenia also needs to keep, get, keep, keep going with its vaccination efforts. But yes. we'll, we won't dwell on that. Which, which I think they're picking up, but yeah, it happens. It has to happen more, but apparently there's a state of, a state of emergency in Tokyo or in Japan. And so it's kind of, uh, that's gonna be kind of weird. There's gonna be no, spectators uh, at the Olympics, but we have 17 athletes going from Armenia, which is great. Uh, and yes, Greg, as you were starting to share this weekend, and it's been a little bit delayed because of COVID itself, but if you guys can see my screen this weekend, the Armenian American Museum, which is gonna be in Glendale, California, the Armenian epicenter in America, if you will, uh, is going to have their official groundbreaking event on Saturday, or excuse me, Sunday, July 11th. So this Sunday, if you are in the area, if you're in Los Angeles, or if you're watching us from LA, definitely go. I mean, you can, uh, I believe you need, you do need to RSVP. So follow the links here, which will be in the feed. I'll even, we'll even have it on our link tree as well, but it's also going to be live uh, broadcast on uh, online on Facebook live and YouTube. And of course, LA Armenian TV station, Horizon there uh, but there's actually a cool map of where the event will be it's actually going to be on the site of the future the future site and they are going to have a ceremonial um what's it called shovel uh groundbreaking during that event so it's something that's really important and it's important for everyone to realize this museum is about armenian american history it's not about the armenian genocide it's not about just armenian history it's about armenian american history and how armenians have contributed to this country so it's important for everyone to realize that and we'll be following it i hope for us greg to go be able to do a live broadcast from the opening i hope we could do an arash media live at the opening of this museum when it happens uh, in a couple of years uh lord willing uh with if everything goes well so well all right man yeah this was a uh, i mean it was it was a tough one sorry folks for the technical difficulties early on Okay. Uh, that was yeah. something completely out of our control, out of Richard's control, out of David's control, out of William's control. Yeah, yeah, that pushed the 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 show twenty minutes into the hour. Um, we'll uh, we'll try to kind of you know rectify these issues in the future. Um, yeah. If you enjoyed the show, if you enjoyed uh, uh, listening to this afterwards, if you're listening to this right now as you're commuting to work, which isn't always live on Facebook, uh, maybe you're you you you're listening to it on YouTube afterwards. Um, yeah spread the word about arash media what we do what we try to do because we are going to build on this platform we're going to try to improve it this is not our full-time job yeah. um, but we uh feel the need to continue we want to inform we want to bring pertinent conversations um and we want to make sure that there's the uh, per pertinent conversations are being had on this platform here exactly uh, and and giving everybody a way to take action. So make sure to check out our check out our link tree for all the ways to get involved, uh, as well as in the feed, you can catch all of the articles uh, in just a few moments. Uh, Vahe Shahinian, uh, one of our viewers tonight, also mentioned that Yegya Sanoyan passed away today. Uh, he was also a Dudu player. Uh, he's saying he's not as big as Jivan internationally but he was an original legend um, of the genre and of Armenian pop music. So I'm not sure if he was a doo-doo player or not, but, but he was a, le a legend in Armenian pop music. So thank you, Vahe, for that information. And uh, yeah, God may, bless you. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. rest in peace. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. next Thursday, we can, we can make that uh, an, an, an item on our, on our news. Exactly. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Next Thursday, 9, 9 p.m., uh, more pertinent conversations, uh, interesting guests, and uh, we'll... Uh, We'll keep we'll keep it going. Uh, I miss I miss Rich today. This was this. Yeah, uh, Rich will be back. We'll have him back for sure. Yeah. All right, All right Greg. Thanks a lot, man. And thanks everyone for watching. Yeah. Have a yeah. good night.